Yo, what is up guys? Thanks again for tuning in to the Wash U Nephrology webisode. I want to just introduce what I'll be doing hopefully for the next couple episodes. I'm going to pilot a new format uh, where I kind of merge nephrology, history, and storytelling all together to hopefully bring across some uh, great teaching, teaching points while emphasizing some of the uh, incredible things that have happened in the field of nephrology uh, over the course of its existence as a specialty. I was inspired um, to do this when uh, reading an article in AJKD um, about uh, reinvigorating uh, education in nephrology and one of the points was to tell a great story. I pulled Twitter uh, to, to hear what people thought were some of the greatest stories. So I'm going to start that off uh, today in this episode and continue it on for the next couple months. Please tell me what you guys think. If you like this new format, we'll definitely be back with some more renal path, some more uh, CPCs and uh, hopefully some board review stuff down the line, but I wanted to give this uh, new thing a shot. I want to thank you again all for watching uh, and tune in for hopefully it, what is a good episode on memberness. Thanks. Okay, before we kick this one off, I want to make sure all of our viewers know that Neff Madness will be returning in March of 2018 and will again be hosted by AJKD. We've been working hard for several months to create eight fantastic regions, 32 exciting topics, which will be revealed on March 15th at ajkdblog.org. That will also be the start date for the brackets. If you're a student, resident, fellow, attending anything, any healthcare worker with an interest in nephrology, please be sure to check it out. Make a bracket, learn and interact with colleagues on Twitter, and most of all, have fun. So again, welcome to our first webisode in a series where I hope to merge nephrology, history, and storytelling. This first episode today, I want to tell the story of the membranous antigen and PLA2R. We know an incredible amount about membranous nephropathy from the animal model history, and it's really a fantastic story through about six decades. So when I was a fellow in 2009 up at Rush Medical Center in Chicago, a membranous case came up in our biopsy conference, and the word Haman nephritis was tossed around by the attendings. I was trying to hide the fact that I had no idea what these words meant, and I ended up looking it up on my own later on, and a fantastic co-fellow of mine, B. Concepcion, presented a fantastic renal grand rounds that detailed all of what I'm going to talk about today. I owe her a lot of credit since a lot of uh, the slides here are taken from a talk that she gave. So this was in 2009 uh, when I was a fellow and it was also right around the time that Dr. Uh, Beck and Dr. Salant published their seminal work in the New England Journal which identified M-type phospholipase A2 receptor or PLA2R as the antigen in the glomerulus uh, in membranous nephropathy. Again the gravity of this discovery was not fully realized by my first year fellow self and the knowledge that I had. But what I want to do now is walk you through the path that it took nephrologists to get to this point. The rat model starts in 1959 with Walter Heyman in Cleveland. He reported the production of nephrotic syndrome by sensitizing rats to a protein in their own kidney. He coined the term autoimmune nephrosis and produced clinical and pathologic pictures of membranous that are virtually indistinguishable, indistinguishable from the human disease. How he did this was by injecting rats with Freund's adjuvant. Freund's adjuvant is an amino potentiator which uh, boosts the immune response. It's made up of a little bit of killed tuberculous bacilli uh, and some other uh, reagents. And if you injected Freund's adjuvant alone, very few rats got renal disease. If you suspended it with uh, liver, uh, same, very uh, few rats got nephrotic disease, but if you took Freund's adjuvant and you added a rat kidney suspension, the rats developed an immune response to something in the kidney suspension which led to nephrotic syndrome that was quite severe in all of these uh, animals. And this model was replicated and over the next couple years electron microscopy immunofluorescence were developed and these findings essentially mimicked what was seen in human membranous. And again, this was termed active Heyman nephritis because it was actively inducing an immune response. The passive Heyman nephritis was introduced in the early 1970s 
and it passively transferred serum and antibodies from donors with the disease. And rats in the active nephritis model would take several weeks to develop lesions, whereas with the passive nephritis model, they would get proteinuria, histologic changes, and immune deposits that were demonstrable within minutes to hours of transfer of serum. And it, this established that this was related to a circulating antibody to an antigen that could be passively transferred from donor to recipient. There was also much less variability in the passive model, and it was easier to reproduce, so it became much easier to study animals with the passive model. Not too long after this, the antigen itself was discovered. So this paper demonstrated that antibodies eluded from glomeruli of rats with either the active or pas passive haemonephritis model would precipitate a 330 kilodalton polypeptide. And because of its size, it was named glycopro glycoprotein 330, or GP330 for short. And this protein was shown to be pathogenic in rats. If you immunize rats against GP330, it would produce sub-epithelial deposits. And if you injected GP330 antibodies, it would produce passive haemonephritis. So eventually this protein was cloned and sequenced, and the actual size of the protein was noted to be 600 kilodaltons rather than 330, as initially precipitated in these western blots. And because it was so much bigger than originally thought, they named it megalin. By the mid-80s or so, the animal model was pretty complete and the pathogenesis was clearly understood. The antigen was megalin and it was located in the rat glomerulus on the sub-epithelial surface below the podocyte foot process. Antibodies would form against megalin, cross the filtration barrier, bind to this antigen, and create antigen antibody complexes. And this creates the membranous and sub-epithelial deposits that are seen on electron microscopy. For a while there in the 90s, there was a search for the human antigen, uh, but nothing came of it. Megalin was found to be present in human proximal tubules, but not the glomerulus itself. And megalin was not seen in immune complexes from human membranous biopsies. And there was this growing sense of frustration amongst researchers trying to identify the human equivalent. Finally, this breakthrough in 2009 by doctors Beck and Salant out of Boston really was made possible because of improved sensitivity of mass spec and microdissection of human biopsy samples. The way in which this was discovered really was not much different from how GP330 and megalin was identified. And what they did was take serum from patients with membranous and used it on western blots of normal human kidney tissue, which was taken from unsuitable deceased donors. In 70% of the cases, or 26 out of 37 patients with idiopathic membranous, Western blotting revealed a 189 or 185 kilodalton band. And using mass spec and protein specific reagents, they identified and characterized the antigen as M type phospholipase A2 receptor. Importantly, this group also localized PLA2R to the glomerulus and more specifically to the podocytes. And this is similar to what was done for megalin in the rats. They also showed that the antibodies, which in primary membranous, primary membranous is IgG4 dominant, those antibodies co-localized to the same area as the PLA2R antigen. In patients with secondary membranous, they showed that the location of the antigen and the antibody were not co-localized, as would be expected in a patient with a disease like lupus, for example, where the antibodies are directed against things like double-stranded DNA rather than PLA2R. And we now have commercial assays to measure PLA2R antibodies in serum and also immunofluorescence of uh, testing to stain PLA2R in kidney biopsy specimens. And really all of that technology has come from this rich history 
of an animal model and persistent research by really excellent nephrologist scientists. So that kind of wraps up the membranous story. I want to end here by showing a visual abstract again by uh, my fantastic uh, former co-fellow B. Concepcion. She created a visual abstract about the active Heyman nephritis model for last year's uh, Neff Madness. I hope you enjoyed this uh, first storytelling episode and now have a better understanding of what is meant when words like Heyman nephritis and megalin are thrown around. I want to thank you all for watching and I'll see you guys next time.